getting to, know, getting to know, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may ho lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So what kept repeating in my mind was being likened to his sufferings and attaining to the resurrection of the dead. And so as we've gone through these, this week, a number of my leaders were still under it. And I thought, Lord, what is it? This is this not even... You know, we've tried to think it was some sort of virus that's out there. Oh, there's a virus out there. But I wasn't convinced. I wasn't convinced that's what it was. So I overcame on in another 24 hours. And let me tell you, I came out of that with the power of his resurrection. I felt so empowered that nothing could stop me. And I just felt like there was just a glory explosion happening in my spirit, even from to this day, I could feel it. I, I've got another level of hearing, another level of seeing visions, another level of just authority. So this is what it was all about. We had such a victory in Raleigh in the, such a way that he let us enter into the fellowship of his sufferings so that we could attain to the power of the resurrection from the dead. And I decree that our team is going to come out and just watch out. We're getting ready to tackle the major strongholds, I'm not saying where, that God, that God had pointed to us that have to do with roots. And I really believe this is the way we ought to live our life now, that I'm on this side. I can testify to that. We have to allow him to, allow him to have us, by his grace, to enter into the fellowship of his sufferings. It feels like an illness, but you know what? We overcame it because once we realized what it was, then God gave us life in Jesus' name. So that's my testimony for that. <laughs> and on the way over here at approximately 8.45 a.m., Jeff was driving and we were riding in. And, you know, we do have a prayer time. And, and many times I have heard things, but this one was so profound to me. And I shared it with Terry and Donna. As we were driving to the Resurrection Sunday service at Impact Church, and as we were in the presence of God, listening to the kingdom by Tasha Cobbs, Cobbs we, which speaks about baptism and the desire to not abuse his grace, I was caught up in the spirit. And I saw angels standing in the sanctuary at Impact side by side. And you couldn't see any space in between, along with a cloud of witnesses, including Pastor Robbins. And there was a celebration by all, like it was a type of Pentecost, with hands lifted up in the air, praising God. As I looked further, there was a huge round well in the midst of the sanctuary right here. Right here. And the angels and the cloud of witnesses were standing around this huge well, side by side. The waters of the water, waters was blue in hue and pure. It looked like a swimming pool, but it was really just pure, pure water. And there was movement in the waters of this oversized well. Then I heard the Lord say, you have a well that has been opened, and you will have baptisms once again. Being baptized in the living waters is coming. Doug Suter. Come on up. You know, Doug actually walked into prayer one night and said, first time we'd ever met him in our life, and he said, is there a well in this place? So, I don't know if that's what you're going to say, but you go right ahead. <laughs> yeah, that's what happened. <laughs> I, I've been, in 2020, uh, God said to go open up wells all over America. And I said, I don't know how to do that, Lord. And he said, I'll teach you. So he did. And then when I came here the first night, God said, open up the well. Open up the well. Because he wants the well open here. Yes. He wants all of you to just jump in the well 
and see his resurrection power. Well, the verse that God gave me this morning, uh, there we go, is um, Colossians 2. It's in the Passion Translation, and it's verse 12. We've been buried with him into his death, unto baptism, unto death. Also means we were raised with him. We believe in God's resurrection power. The power that raised him from death's realm. We're not living dead people anymore, but we're alive because of the blood of Jesus. 13 says, this realm of death describes our former state. We were held in sin's grasp, but now we've been resurrection, resurrected out of that realm of death, never to return, for we forever live and are alive, forgiven of all our sins. I was such a sinner before I came to the Lord, but now I, all things have passed away and all things have become new. I don't look at the ba- bad things I did before. I only look to the future. It's like, oh, yes, Lord. And then he gave me one more scripture. It was Colossians 3.1 in the Passions translation. Christ's resurrection is your resurrection too. Yes. This is why we yearn for all that is above. Who's focused on the things down here on earth? That's only temporary. We're to be focused on things above. That's eternal. For that's where Christ sits enthroned at the place of all power, honor, and authority. And then we're seated in heavenly places, so we have the same power, honor, and authority. We don't have the honor, but we have the same power and authority. It's all about his honor. It's nothing about our honor, but it's all about us raising Jesus up for people to see and hear and know the truth of God's word. So I just ask God to just bless you all abundantly, that you get a new love for the Lord Jesus Christ that you have never seen before, and you'll fall in love with him more and more and more as you walk with him. In Jesus' name, amen. Don't leave yet. Doug is leaving in a couple of weeks to go to Japan again to prayer walk. I just want a few to come up, and we're going to pray and lay hands on. Come on, Duke, you're going to be next anyway. So, I just want us to pray. If you would just extend your hand to, towards Doug. He's prayer walked the world because God has told him to do this. Yes. He sees miracles. He sees wonders. This is what the resurrected life is all about. It's not coming to church on Sunday morning, singing three songs and going home and eating at Mr. C's. That's not what it's about. It's about walking out in life and transforming every person we see. It's about carrying the glory and the presence of Almighty God wherever He sends us. We are on assignment because of the empty tomb. And if we, are not, if we do not understand that, we, we are nullifying the power of what Jesus did on Resurrection, Resurrection Sunday, what God did through him. As he goes into Japan, he's going to touch many, many lives as he did before. Okinawa, he travels. He's traveled all over the world, all over the nation. And, you know, and God has sent him to Concord from Indiana. They're in the process of moving. Why? Because the presence of God is in Concord, and that's what we're looking for. God is sending those he wants to bring, and he's sending out those he wants to send out. So, Lord, we thank you for Doug and Barb, and we thank you for the life, the example they have. Lord, we just pray as he goes into Japan this this coming uh, couple weeks, Lord. We pray, Lord God, that you're going to direct every step that he and his prayer partner have. You're going to direct every assignment, Lord. Every person, you've already preordained and handpicked those that they are to meet. And God, I thank you that you have made provision for him. I thank you, Father God, in the spirit realm, Lord, the angels are waiting to do the bidding of your word at their command. I thank you in advance for signs, wonders, and miracles that are going to follow after them because they believe. They believe in the resurrected Jesus. They don't believe in a dead religion. They believe in the resurrected Jesus. Lord, we don't need more dead religion. We need the power of Almighty God that raised Jesus from the dead alive and at work in the earth. 
Lord, I thank you for what you're doing, the assignments you've given to Doug and Barb. And we just pray blessing upon this time. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Thank you. So she wanted me to share what the resurrection means to me, my life. When we first came here, like the, we all were sinners, when we first came here, the teaching was on uh, tithing. I didn't have to unlearn church. I had to learn. I, I was a blank slate. I knew nothing. So we learned, within the first month we, taught, we were taught about tithing, we began to tithe, and he showed us his hand. The following week, I was supernaturally healed of hypothyroidism. So every week, for the first couple of weeks, every week I was seeing God in everything. Then fast forward to a couple of months ago, I was diagnosed with having, um, the doctor said I had emphysema. She can see a little emphysema. And I'm like, I don't see that. So they gave me a test uh, to see if I got COPD. Because normally, in order to have emphysema, you've got to have COPD. Well, they gave me the breathing test, and I have not, do not have COPD. So then they said, well, we're going to do a PET scan because the, the reason why they did all this, they had found a spot on my lung. We're going to do a PET scan because we, we see something there. So she calls me back and says, nothing lit up. And I'm like, well, praise God, because I already know the resurrected life says I don't have to deal with sickness. That means I'm healed completely. The fact that I had a horrible childhood, I walked around with my head hung down a lot until I surrendered to Christ. Now I can walk around without the shame, without the guilt, because the resurrection took that away from me. I can walk with my head held high. Um, the scripture I was going to use, I can't find it, but anyway, I think it's 220. When the first time <laughs> I was supposed to speak in front of people, and I'm like, I can't do that. And that's what I used to tell them, I, was, I can't do that. My brother-in-law gave me the scripture, Galatians 2.20. He said, not you, but the Christ living through you. It's not your life anymore. It's Christ's life. And you have to be obedient and speak and let him speak through you. So that's, that's my scripture. And, and the other scripture is Ezekiel when it says, speak to those dry bones, because my bones were dirt dry. And someone spoke to these dry bones and awakened me, and I know it was a resurrection that has me standing here today. So praise God. The power of Jesus. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about the fact that it's alive today and it's in us. Who wants to come old, dead, dry religion? That you got to have these rules and that rules and these rituals and those rituals. No wonder, no wonder the churches are emptying out. We've got to have the power and the presence of Almighty God. We can't be ashamed to say things like resurrection, Calvary, and Jesus. We can't be afraid to say those things because we don't offend anybody. Come on, guys. You know that. I'm, I'm not talking to anybody in here for sure. Trying to decide when I want to get the next person up because it's going to be really intense. Uh, everybody should have gotten the handout when you came in. Because of the resurrection power, we're going to have 21 days of prayer and fasting. 21 days of prayer and fasting, contending for the glory of God. I've been waiting all year for the Lord. I don't like to just say, oh, let's do a fast. Well, we can do that, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with choosing to fast indiscriminately. But I like for the, when we do corporate fasts, I like for the Lord to say, I want you to fast. It's never been clear in my life of the, more, the most appropriate time that we are in for prayer and fasting. Never. We're in a, we're in a time of, of dire need in our nation, in our churches, in our families. And it's only through the resurrection power of Jesus that anything is ever going to change. Why do I know that? Because if it was going to change, it would have changed. It would have already changed if it was going to change. So we've got to have something now that we haven't had in the past, and we need the power of God. We need an encounter. You know, the Lord, the Lord said to me again yesterday when I was arguing with him about this message that I thought I was going to bring. He said, the church doesn't need another sermon. It needs an encounter with the power of God. That's what it'll take. Now, you can have them both at the same time, obviously. And you know I love to teach. I could teach all day. And I've got a little bit I'm going to do. But I want you to encounter the reality of the presence of Almighty God that he's available for you today. 
that he can, you can have those radical moments of transformation. I know Doug was talking, myself, our transformation, our salvation was a radical, it was light to, it was darkness to light. It was radical. We were talking last night and we had at the well and we were saying that, you know, before I got born again, I was doing all kind of stuff. I was helping a friend get an abortion. I saw nothing wrong with that. I was upset with her that she got herself in that position. I made the arrangements. I made the appointment. I took her in. The day I got born again, nobody had to say, now we need to have a lesson on what's appropriate. I knew that I knew that I knew that it was. Nobody had to tell me any of this. See, darkness became light. That's the power of the resurrection. Not religion. I had been in a church, but not religion. Religion won't teach you that. It's the awareness of the presence of God in our lives that will show you what is the right way and what is the wrong way. And so some of these excuses we make, well, I didn't know this. No, if you've got the Holy Spirit, you know right from wrong. You know right from wrong. We know right from wrong. So we're going to be contending for the glory for 21 days, and I've given you some scripture, and, and, just, and all I'm asking us to do is choose a meal through the day. Any, you can do any one you want. And today you might choose, tomorrow you might choose breakfast, Tuesday you might choose lunch, Wednesday you might choose dinner, whatever works for you. But take that time and devote it to fervent prayer. Fervent prayer. Seeking God. Don't, turn your cell phone off. Get rid of your, your internet, whatever it might be. You know, we can pray for an hour without having to get online and search out what we need to do, right? <laughs> Let's just seek God's. If we do nothing but sit, stand in his, his presence, seek his face. God, I just want your face. I want your presence. I want your power. Show me my heart. I want to lay my heart on the altar because we are master deceivers of our own condition. We can convince ourselves that everything we do is right when it's not right in God's eyes. And there's a problem when the church is powerless. I'm talking about the church at large. Any church, when there's no power in the church and there's only entertainment but no transformation, there's a problem. There is a problem, and we've got to get away from that. If we want to see our nation change, the church has got to change. To see our church change, we have to change. We have to change. And that's why Jesus was raised from the dead. Not so it can just be a nice history story. He had been just like Muhammad and all these others, that Buddha and all these others that are in their grave. The cross did do a lot, but the resurrection changed everything. And that's why the resurrection is so important. I'm going to give you seven benefits in a moment of the, the benefits of the resurrection in our today life. And what, I wish I'd have known this when I was four or six or 12 or 16 or 26. I would have made a lot of different decisions than I made. But, you know, you only know what you know, right? Today's a new day. We don't, we don't beat ourselves up. But just some prayer time suggestions here. Just pull aside. Find that secret place. In January of 22, the Lord told me about the holy, the secret place. He says it's our trysting place. He says it's our place where you come so close to me that you can smell my breath. He says, it's a place where we do transaction. You don't beg me. We do transaction. It's where heaven touches earth. That's the place we need to be in in the next 21 days. I have a feeling that some are going to be prolonging their fast. I really do believe that. For the last three, four years, the Lord has said that you've got to devour the words. You've got to seek my presence. He said, there's such a thing and evil coming upon the world. He said, the only way you're going to survive, and I'll use that word lightly, is to get into the glory and right above the fray. That's biblical. You study the scripture and that's exactly what has happened. That's where he wants us to be. That's the power of the resurrection. It's not religion. It's a power of resurrection. Don't allow distractions. Journal what you're hearing because we want to hear what you're hearing. We want to see, that's the beautiful thing. What does it say in Hebrews? It says we can boldly enter into the presence of God now because what of the blood that Jesus carried into the Holy of Holies? We have boldness to enter into the presence of God. What does that mean? We're going to have goosebumps and lay on the floor? No, it means He's going to talk to us. His Spirit is going to fill us. We're going to walk in that wisdom and that authority that He has given to us because we have audience with the Lord God Almighty. He's going to tell you, Melissa, where you need to go and what you need to do. He's going to tell you to not go here, go there. Talk to this person. Don't talk to that person. Pay that bill for that person. Don't pay that one for that one. He's going to tell you when to lay hands on the sick that you meet somebody on the street. 
And he's going to say, do you have a thyroid condition? Well, how did you know? Pow, she's healed. That's the power of the resurrection. That's not religion. That's what we have to, that's what we have to seek after. There's so many people that need what you carry. What you have the ability to carry. There's so many people that need what we have to carry. And you may see them on the street and never see them in a church. I'm telling you, the masses are hurting. The masses of people are hurting. We see them every day. The masses are hurting, and they need to know what you know. And many don't. And many never will unless somebody tells them. We're going to be praying on Thursday mornings at 9 o'clock if you're available. Join us here corporately. And I'm going to ask Terry if he will come and share what he has. This is very important. Then I'm going to give you seven benefits of the resurrection. It's intense in here this morning. Trust you feel that. Resurrection allows us to have relationship with the Father in a very intimate way. And we have a great relationship for 44 years almost being married. We talk all the time. And sometimes in a relationship, the person you're closest with even gives you advice when you don't ask for it. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, isn't that right, Ron? But God does that too. That's what relationship's all about. This week has been the most intense week of my relationship with God in my lifetime since 1979. I hear from the Spirit of God frequently. I do have a lot of visions and dreams. This week, literally last night, I just told Donna, I've been up most of the night. I said, I'm exhausted because of the pressure and the presence of God. I was literally tired. It was a great tiredness, though, because it was, I was wrapped up with his arms. I want to read you this and just share it. I'm going to read a little bit and then share some. This was Friday night. Mary, I do take times to 8.30 p.m. I'd, I'd put the time down. It's important to know when he's speaking. And for about two hours, the intensity of the presence of God was so thick. We were both in our prayer room, and Donna was uh, meditating and possibly preparing for this weekend, and I was just covered in the presence of God. But I felt him pressing in, Joe. It was like a vice. It was a good kind of vice. It was just, ooh, squeezing. And I knew the time of fulfillment of God's assignments are upon us as a body. The time is now. The masses of hurting people that Donna referred to, they're coming. The numbers are increasing that we're coming in contact with, and I'm sure you too, but the masses are coming. As I was processing what I was experiencing in God's presence, suddenly I had an open vision and I saw an old ancient Colosseum in front of me. It's like a Roman Colosseum. As I looked at this structure, what normally would have housed maybe thousands of people was completely empty. Then I heard, it's time to step into the arena. At that moment, I found myself standing inside that massive, colossal building all alone. I knew the upcoming fast that was approaching us was crucial in our lives and in the life of impact. As I stood there alone, I heard these words, battles are won and battles are lost in the arena. Life and death is decided in the arena. Let me ask you, are you struggling with something and you can't find an answer? Have you stepped into the arena? Are you still an observer? The Holy Spirit said uh, that you're, you, will, you will come face to face with who you really are in this arena. And I thought, God, I know who I really am. And as I thought that, he said, no, you don't. 
I'm going to expose who you really are to yourself, and you'll know who you really are. I promise you, you step into the arena, who you really are will become evident. Your deficiencies will be displayed by God to you, nobody else but to yourself. Because he wants to heal, he reveals to heal, we've heard many times. This fast is crucial. It's the most crucial thing that Donna has ever called in this church. I know that. We know that. I think many of you do. I hope you all do. I think it's truly a time of life or death for us as a nation, maybe individually in our walk with God, but as a nation, we're at a tipping point. We can't go much further. And if we don't stop it, if we don't step into the arena and have a relationship with God and let him speak to us, we will not save this nation. We've been given control. God's in charge. He's given us control. You heard that a while ago. That's why the nation is so upside down because we've been in control, but we've been out of control. The last thing the Spirit spoke to me, he said, when you walk out of the arena, you must leave yourself inside the arena. You can't take yourself with you. What I'm going to reveal has to stay in there, and a new man's going to walk out. God's giving us a chance in this fast for him to reveal our true selves so he can heal us. We have a job to do. The nation is at stake. Our cities, our families, our communities, but our nation is at stake. And it's up to us. I think about our grandchildren. We have six wonderful grandchildren. Some of them are uh, not following God. That's putting it lightly. I don't want them to miss it and end up in hell because I didn't pray enough. How much do we pray for people that we know that are lost and would not and miss God and go, go to hell. We don't say that much in church world anymore. It's just a reality, though. How much time do we really spend in intercession for the people that are lost? I'm not asking you. I'm asking me. You just happen to be looking at me. Because I have to examine myself first and foremost. What am I doing? What price am I paying? How much intercession and prayer time am I spending for those that are lost? We'll find out in the arena because you lay it all down there and it's life or death and you can walk out and fulfill God's call on your life and your families and in this nation. You know, the call, you know, the call we have is so critically important. God designed you in your mother's womb for the purposes of his kingdom. And resurrection is like, well, I thought it was supposed to be a real happy celebration. It is because we get to do what Jesus has enabled us to do. It's not just about a church service on Sunday one time a year. It's not that. It's been, that's been so the case, the norm. Understanding who we are and that we have been empowered to walk in the calling that God has given to us to walk in. I was ministering with a young couple this week, actually doing some marriage counseling with them, and he dropped the bomb on his fiance that he felt he had a call. And I saw her head turn in a millisecond to look at him, and I thought, seems like you guys might need a conversation. And they said, maybe we do. But he was willing just, he said, well, I can do this and I can do that. And I said, well, you know, not every call is standing behind a pulpit. Actually, that's the, that's the smallest number of people should be behind, 2%, Peter Wagner says. The rest should be out there in the world. The marketplace is a tremendous place for ministry. I said, or government, or schools, whatever it is. Whatever you're doing, what is, is a, it's, your, it's your marketplace, it's your, it's your educational place, it's your place of ministry, it's where you are assigned. And we think sometimes because we're not standing behind a pulpit, we're not answering the call. No, no, no. That is not the case. The next morning I was dry, uh, dry, uh, writing or something in my car and I was listening to an audible book and it was by, about uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer's life. And one of his famous sayings you have heard, I'm sure, is when God calls a man or a woman or a child, when God calls a man, he bids him to come and die. 
And that's what Terry is talking about. To answer the call God's placed in us, we have to be willing to say, God, I'm here to die. Not physically. I'm here to die to every desire. And I sent that to this young man. He was very appreciative. You have to die to your own desires. Die to your own plans. What is it, God, you would have me to do? Usually we find that whatever God has called us to do, we kind of flow into that because that's our natural gifting and we enjoy doing those things, but not always. We have a relative who left the ministry because of just bad church. He went into corporate America, extremely successful. They were in Washington several years ago, walking down the street. What looked like a street person walked up to him and stood in front of him and put his finger in his face and said, didn't I call you to preach my gospel? And turned around and walked away. That'll shake you up. Now he can preach the gospel wherever he's at. But that'll shake you up when God points you out. See, this is about resurrection. We're not going into this thing empty-handed. We have the power of the resurrection in our life, and that's what we have to understand. So I want to ask us, has the crucifixion and has the resurrection of Jesus been just another event in history in our life so far? You know, it's made a lot of news this week. Have you, you realize all the news that has been made, you know, where our illustrious president blasphemed the most important event in the history of the world by declaring it as Transgender Visibility Day. The tomb is for the transgender. God loves the transgender people. But you don't take the day as the, it recognizes the most holy day of the earth on the earth, in history, and totally move away from his true purpose. The day before, he declared that there will be no religious symbols in our White House. We're, we're on a slippery slope in this nation. We're on a very slippery slope. This is why the church has got to rise up. The church has got to rise up. If we were to ask our children today, or maybe even some adults. What is Easter all about? It would be about bunny rabbits and chickens and new clothes. Visit the grandmas in spring break. But what is the power of the empty tomb? Zach, I'm, going to, I'm not going to do that video. What is the power of the empty tomb? What does it really mean? What would it really mean to us? I'm going to give you seven benefits very quickly. And you actually have a sheet. I, I want to go through these quickly because I really want you to take this home. Maybe this is something you can use in your time of fasting. And actually I put Terry's word on the back. There's such an arrogancy in the body of Christ that I know it all. That I have it all. Unless we're doing the work that Jesus did, you don't have it all. None of us have it all. Unless we're doing the work that we've been called to do. He said the same works I do, you will do and greater works. The first thing, the first benefit for our, uh, from the resurrection, the empty tomb, is the fact that we have our justification. In other words, that puts us in relationship with God. We are just as if we have never sinned. We have that relationship with God Almighty. Romans 4.25 says that he was crucified for the forgiveness of our sin and was raised back to life to prove that we were made right with God. That's what it's all about. It's all about the fact that we have been forgiven, but we have been justified. We are just as if we have never sinned. Do we understand the power of what that really means? To be just as if you have never sinned. What does that mean in our life? Everything God has is available to us. Colossians 1.22 says, Even though you were once distanced from Him, living in the shadows of your evil thoughts and actions, He brought you back to Himself. He released His supernatural peace to you through the sa sacrifice of His own body as the sin payment on your behalf. Why? I was listening. I, I just stumbled on this. I really don't... I, I, nothing wrong with this person. I love Catherine Kuhlman, actually. But I was listening to her, a little video clip that was on something, and she said she was telling the people... You can have what I have if you'll pay the price. I'm nothing special, she said. You can have what I have if you'll pay the price. A.A. A. Allen wrote, The Price of God's Miracle Working Power. But see, we get satisfied. We get lulled to sleep. We get apathetic. Everything's going well. We measure our success by our dollars in the bank or, or whatever it is, the size car we drive or the house we live in. Well, that's how we measure our success. That's not success. 
Howard Hendricks says, the thing I fear the most is that you'll be successful at the wrong thing. If we're not touching lives, then we're not being successful. We're just being busy. Number two is our imperishable hope of salvation and eternal life. First Peter says, be blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope. We have that hope of eternal life. And you know if you've been born again. If nothing changed, you haven't been born again. You can't look in the face of God and stay the same. None of us can. None of us can. Through the resurrection, Jesus has earned for us the new life that we receive when we get born again. And if you can't look at a time in your life and say, I know when I was born again, I would get on my face and say, God, I need you. I need this experience. Or maybe you said, I know I have, but I've walked away. God, I need you. I need this, I need this, this relationship. I told this young man, I said, you're never going to be happy till you're answering the call, but you've got to decide what that call is and don't think it's in a church behind a pulpit. Could be. I don't think it is. I don't think it is. There's a lot of people that need you out there. Number three, we have joint seating with Christ. Do we understand what this means? Ephesians 2. Out of the Amplified says, even when we were dead, Slain by our own shortcomings and trespasses, he made us alive together in fellowship and in union with Christ. He gave us the very life of Christ himself. What part of that can't we believe? The same new life with which he quickened him, for it is by grace, his favor and mercy, which you did not deserve, that you were saved. Now listen to this. And he raised us up together with him, made us sit down together, giving us joint seating with him. See, that's our position but is that where we are? He said, we have joint seating. We have, what does that mean? It means co-seating, equal authority, equal rights. That's why Jesus said, the same work I do, you will do, because I'm going to my Father. That's what resurrection power is all about. You can do, I can do what Jesus did because he was raised from the grave, and the Father gave us that privilege. Let's not squander it another day. Ephesians 1 3 says, Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm has already been lavished upon us. Already been lavished upon us. What are those spiritual blessings? Things that pour out from the Holy Spirit. It's what we were hearing. It's God giving you a dream, God giving you a vision, God giving you a word, walking up to somebody and God giving you a word for them, and they need it just like that. You don't have a clue. The man that came up to you, how many of us, we've all experienced that, hopefully, where we'll just have a word for someone and we don't really say chapter and verse or thus says the Lord. That'll turn a lot of people off. You'll just know what to say at the right time. And that ministers to that person and brings life and hope to them. See, that's the heavenly blessings. That's the spiritual blessings. It's a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge. It's the power to heal. It's a power of faith to believe. It's to hear when the world is going crazy that God is saying to you, you're people of Goshen. Don't worry. You can ride above the fray. Don't worry. Just get close to me. Get into the secret place. Hear what I'm saying to you. We've been given every spiritual blessing, it tells us. Number four is our spiritual power. Ephesians 1.19 says, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe Him. The same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated Him in the place of honor in the God's right hand is ours. It's like having power in your house but keeping your switch turned off. Most of the church has a switch turned off. They wouldn't know what to do with a sick person if they came up to them. That doesn't mean you don't go to doctors. I had a conversation with somebody recently. I'm believing in that. I said, you better get to the doctor. God gave doctors wisdom and knowledge. That's power. But let the work, power of God and the power of the doctors work together. Let's don't get foolish and throw out the baby with the bathwater. Right? It's interesting in, in Ephesians 1.19, it says, I pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power. That word is dunamis, that's supernatural power. But then when he says this is the same mighty power, that's kratos. That's another word. That means power that gives authority to govern or controlling power, power to direct or determine. He says, I pray you'll understand the incredible greatness of the supernatural power you have, but it's the same power and authority that you have to govern your life to determine things in life that need to be determined. 
And then Philippians 3.10, he says, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power, dunamis, that raised him from the grave. We've lost that, we've lost that hunger for the presence and the power of God. We've been satisfied. That's not what the empty tomb is about. The empty tomb is not about satisfaction. It's, a, it's about transaction. It's about changing things in the earth to look like they do in heaven. That's what it's about. Number five, it's our message of faith. 1 Corinthians 15 says, But now if Christ the Messiah is preached as raised from the dead, how is it that some of you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not risen. And if Christ has not risen, then our preaching is in vain. It amounts to nothing, and your faith is the void of truth and is fruitless. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 says, But the truth is Christ is risen from the dead. See, we just have to push a button in our brain and say, I choose to believe this. I choose to believe this. We choose to believe that the Word of God is truth. What happens if you choose not to believe? Then you're going to go in another direction. You can choose to believe what's on the news every day. You can choose to believe what God's Word says every day. You can choose to believe the prophets that are really hearing. A lot of them are hearing their own selves. But if you're in the secret place, you're going to know when they're speaking truth. You're going to get that tilt when somebody starts prophesying all this mess. You better know how to run from them, especially in this season that we are in. Especially in this season. Number six is our power over sin. Many people still say, Christians, oh, well, you can't live without sinning. Yes, you can. The Bible tells us we can live without sinning. But if we do sin... We go to the Father, we ask for forgiveness, and He forgives us and cleanses us. Romans 6, 9 through 13 says, We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and He will never die again. Death no longer has any power over Him. When He died, He died once to break the power of sin. But now that He lives, He lives for the glory of God. So you should also consider yourself dead to the power of sin. The problem is right here. We get enticed with our minds. We, we start looking. We start, we start craving. We start lusting. The mind, life and death, and the power of the mind the, and the tongue. So we're going to win the battle, lose the battle with sin right here. If you fill in your mind with a bunch of junk, you're going to live a junk-filled life. If you're watching junk on TV, you're going to live that. You're going to follow the flow of your thought processes. That's neuroscience. Forget the Bible. That's neuroscience. You're going to follow the flow of what you pull in your mind, put in your mind. The Scripture just happens to say, above all you guard, you guard your heart, for out of it flows the very issues of your life. We tell our guys that are addicted to porn, How, what do you do? Well, I can't help it. Throw away your computer. you got to do what you got to do. It's better to go into heaven without eyes than it is to go into hell whole, right? That's what Jesus said. I didn't say it. He said it. Do we believe it or don't we believe it? Then he says, so do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. He's not saying you won't have the desires. He said don't give in to them. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. That's your eyes, your mouth, your feet, your hands, whatever you're doing. Instead, give yourselves completely to God for you were dead and now you have a new life. See, sinners are going to act like sinners. And if Christians are acting like sinners, they're not Christians. They're sinners. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. I'm giving you the Bible. This is what the Scripture says, not my opinion. So resurrection power gives, a, resurrection power, gives us power and victory over sin. And our flesh no longer has to rule. We can make excuses all we want to. Well, I can't help it. I have this addiction. Break the addiction. Resurrection power will break every addiction in your life. It will. The devil no longer has authority to persuade you of sin unless you give it to him. The devil can only use what we give to him. We've won the victory because Jesus won the victory for us. And we have to walk in that newness of life. And number seven is for our new life in Christ. Galatians 2.20. And I think, some, I think somebody was mentioning that. Oh, Miss Duke. Listen to this. Paul was saying, My old self has been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. But Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me and through me. See, we have we crucified. If God calls a person, he says, come and die. 
We have to die to ourselves before we can ever answer the call. We have to die to ourselves before we can ever answer the call. Romans 6, 4 says, Sharing in his death by our baptism means that we were co-buried and entombed with him so that when God's glory raised Christ from the dead, we were also raised with him. Do we believe that? We have been co-resurrected with him so that we could be empowered to walk in the freshness of this new life. You and I have been empowered by the, the power of the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. So, well, I don't know, that's a little stranger than what I normally hear. I'm, this is Bible. This is just Bible. I have nothing to give you. I don't have an opinion other than what the Word says. Somebody asked me one time, what do you think about this? I said, let's see what God's Word says. I have no opinion other than what God's Word says. Forty-five years ago, the Lord said, you've got to decide what you're going to believe. You're either going to believe the, your mind, the way you intellectualize things, or you're going to believe the word. I said, I choose to believe the word, which made no sense half the time to my mind. But the more I began to get into the word, suddenly it began to make sense. Suddenly I began to see the reality of the word and the power of God. Suddenly you could lay hands on the sick and see them recovering. That makes no sense, does it? Suddenly you could look at somebody and see demons coming out of them. That makes no sense, but that's the power of the resurrection. And you could say, in Jesus' name, be healed. In Jesus' name, be free. It's, it's uncomfortable sometimes to go through life and you walk in and you see people that have demons all through them. That doesn't mean we just walk up and slap them and say, you know, we, we have to move as God says. Move. Jesus, I only do what I see the Father do. God may not be ready for that person yet. God may not be ready to heal somebody yet. There's a lot of reasons people do not get healed. And ignorance is one. Unforgiveness is one. Resentment is one. Sin is one. Many reasons. I want to ask you, how are you using your benefits today? How are you using your benefit? How will you use them tomorrow? How will you use them tomorrow? Terry, I want you to come back and would you mind sharing what you heard in prayer last night? This is pretty. I actually put this on Facebook without his approval, but he forgave me. We're in a serious time, guys. We're in a serious time. And ironically, after I posted that on Facebook, I turn on, I don't ever listen to Lance Wallen. I love him. I just don't ever listen to him. I don't listen to many, hardly anybody because I want to hear what God's saying to me. It was almost identical what he had heard in prayer last night. The mouth of two witnesses. That's okay. I've never heard anything like this before. I'll just read it. Donna had forwarded an email to me from someone in another country that I don't know, but it was a, she had a powerful dream that described the perilous times we were living in. The dream parallel with the dream I had in January of 2019 of a devastating time that was to occur in the future. While reading this person's dream and seeing how it so closely coincided with several dreams and visions I have had, I once again was being drawn into our prayer room. Shortly after arriving in there, the Spirit shared the following. I heard last call all aboard. As though a train conductor was making a final call to board the train before its departure. I began to ponder the phrase last call and also wondered about the destination of the train. As I prayed and asked God to reveal the meaning to me, I believe the last call represents the Spirit of God allowing His called remnant one final opportunity to sweep their house clean and fill the empty areas with the renewed baptism of His Spirit. The church at large and even some in the remnant have let the Spirit of God lessen in their lives. Some have become very complacent and even lazy in their relationship with God. The times ahead will be very treacherous and we must be filled with the Spirit of God if we're going to overcome and stand in a place of victory. This is a time to self-reflect, repent, and totally surrender everything or we will be defeated in the battle ahead. There is no time to delay. Procrastination will be our greatest enemy. The timing of this call to fast and pray was a divinely inspired Kairos moment. 
We can't miss this moment in time or it may be our last call. What is the destination? It is clearly evident the harvest is ripe and being prepared. God wants his family restored. Families, communities, cities, and nations are crumbling and disintegrating before our eyes. The remnant must arise in the power of the Holy Spirit and thrust our swords into the ground and defy the powers of darkness to attempt to advance one more step. That's in our capability. We can stop their final assault if we rise up in the power of the Spirit of the Lord. The victory is ours to gain or lose. The victory is within us if we choose correctly. Last call, all aboard. Yes, we are in a serious time. But we're also in the greatest time in history. I've never been so excited about the time we're in. See, if we know whose side we're on, it's, it's fun, isn't it? It's so much fun just to, to work and, and do the work that God has called us to do. S uh, several weeks ago, our VP at Genesis told me, I don't know if she knew about Terry's 2019 dream. He had a dream where there's masses of people, and then he said out of the middle of the parking lot, they were all in a parking lot. They were all needing help. They were broken, bruised. Out of the middle of the parking lot, a, a church sprung up, and, and he said he heard us, the church in the marketplace. Our VP, I don't know that she knew about this dream, I'm not sure, but she said a few weeks ago she was in prayer, and she said she saw the doors of our building being locked because we had no more room for people. And she said it looked like Black Friday, you know how they'll come in and they'll have to try to bombard. And she said someone pointed to the left and said, the church can help you. See, you're the church. You're the church. You're the person on the job that can help that person. You know, we deal with a lot of people who suffer major depression. Do you know what it takes for them to make one call? And if you don't answer the call then, the chances are when you call back, they will not answer the phone. We've seen this in reality. You might be at that Kairos point with a person when the Holy Spirit is dealing with them on the job, in the, in the department store, wherever you might be, at the gas pumps. And that might be at that moment where they finally got the, the, the nerve to say, I need help, and you're there. But if we get so busy, we turn away, and you know they may not get that help again. They may not get that help again. Brokenness. We talked about the transgender population. God loves these people. 80% of them suffer mental health issues. 30% get help. We're making an all-out effort to reach as many as we can because these are beautiful people, just like you're beautiful people. Sin is sin in God's eyes. A liar, a cheat, God didn't care. Sin is sin. It'll separate us from God. This is what resurrection power is all about. It's about you and I carrying the glory of God into a world that's hurt and broken. Jesus came for the world. God so loved the world that he sent Jesus. God so loves the world that he's sending each one of us. I want you to stand, if you will. We're going to take communion. I'm going to ask Jeff to come in just a second. But I want to give you a moment of just to meditate on your own self. And I'm going to ask you as, as we begin this fast, I want you to truly take this so seriously because it is such a critical time that we are in. God is incredible. Zach, just put on something background that we can just do something. I want you to remember that the tomb is empty. It's empty for you and it's empty for me. Jesus died on the cross so we could have forgiveness of sin. But he was raised from the dead so we could stand before God just as if we had never sinned. We could stand before God holy and blameless and above reproach. We can come into the presence of our Father and ask him any. We don't beg our Father. Your kids don't beg you, do they? Most fathers are trying to give it faster than the kids want it or need it. God, I just say, Lord, work on our hearts. Reveal our hearts to us, holy God. 
Reveal our hearts to us, Lord. We just want to be like you, Lord Jesus. You've empowered us to walk in victory. You've empowered us to live above sin. You've empowered us, Lord, to have a relationship with the Father. You've empowered us to walk in power and authority. You've done this for us, Lord. You've done this for us. God, on behalf of all of us, Lord, I just ask that you would minister to our hearts and to our spirit. Show us, Lord, where we're not quite up to snuff with what you would have us to be. You only reveal to heal. You never condemn. You only reveal to heal. Lord, we're tired of old dry, dead religion. No more. We want the power of the Spirit operating and flowing in our lives, in our church. Signs, wonders, and miracles will happen in this place. They're already happening, Lord. We're seeing them. They're happening. Thank you, Lord. Lord, help us to realize we have the answer to the people's need that you bring our way. We're not ill-equipped. Lord, help us to guard our hearts. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And as we take communion, I want us to understand that communion is not just a religious liturgical act. It is a spiritual sacrament. Something takes place when we recognize and we come into agreement and we acknowledge what Jesus has done for us. Thank you. Jeff, will you come? And I want to let you know my book is, just came out. It was printed last week. It's out there if you, if you want to get a copy, the list. I think it will bless you. I've already had several people talk about what they are getting out of it. So be blessed. morning as we um, my friend Mary and Simon came and as we began to talk as we do as friends scripture starts popping in I love that and he scripture came in it says while we were yet sinners Christ died for us and as I looked that up I went back to it's Romans 5 8 verse 5 6 for when we were still without strength Christ died for the ungodly that's all of us as he works in our lives before uh, we walk with him. As we look back at history and we look at what the Jewish people have instigated festivals to celebrate specific things that have happened, Passover, etc. Even in the United States, we have done the same, Thanksgiving Day being one of the big ones. And we know all that week of Thanksgiving, we, and even sometimes we'll preach about it weeks before, to be thankful, to be thankful, to be thankful. And if today is not a day of thanksgiving, wow, for us. And we're thankful for our nation, but we are most thankful for what God and what Jesus has done for us. And actually, Jesus instigated this festival as we're going to celebrate it here. One of the things that came to me, and I'll, this will be just a minute, was a song that an old hymn we used to sing. I'm not going to sing it. I'm not going to play a video but it's on Christ, the solid rock, I stand. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is seeking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. So as we enter into this Jesus ordained celebration here. I want to recall the scripture in Isaiah, but he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Apostle Paul in Corinthians says, for I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread. 
and gave thanks to God for it. Thank you, Father. And as he broke it in peace, pieces, and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And then after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. Lord, today, this is a day of thanksgiving for us, thanking you for what you did for us on the cross, the redemption of sin and the exchange of righteousness. Jesus, we honor you today. We thank you today. May we walk in such a way as to represent you well. Amen. Amen. We want to give you the opportunity and the privilege to give to the church today, to give to God through this church and for his work. And so we'll give you that opportunity now in Jesus' name. <clears throat> 